Okay, so tonight we're, we're going on with the messages that the pastor's been preaching. Check your messages. God is sending us a message right in the book of Revelation. And it's, I believe it's not only for the church of, of the, the seven churches there, but it's for us today. I love the very beginning of Revelations 1-3 where it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And if the time was at hand 2,000 years ago, then I'm for sure the time is at hand, is at hand today where we are living in this time. Um, then it shows Jesus Christ standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And I, I know the, can, the seven candlesticks is like a, is a menorah. And you see the menorah in the Old Testament all the time. And it was always to stay lit. And it reminds me that we, the church, needs to have the Holy Spirit upon our lives. And we need to be the light of the world. We need to be the salt that God's called us to be. And we can only do that by what uh, Valerie talked about Sunday morning was the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, empowering us to do what he wants us to do as a church and as individuals. The word of God is also a reproof. I like the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So the Lord has a message for the church, and it's, it's a message of correction. It's a message of, of uh, encouraging the church to go forward. And so I want to just recap what the pastor has been um, talking about and preaching on the, on the six churches that is before today. So, so the church of Ephesus was a loveless church. They, lost, they left their first love, and the Lord told them to repent. The church of Smyrna was a persecuted church. Uh, don't be afraid, he said. Be faithful unto death. And he said, I will give you a crown of life. The church of Pergamos was a compromising church, holding the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, and the Lord said, repent. The church of Thyatira was a corrupt church, they were doing things that were right, except they were allowing Jezebel to bring in wrong doctrine, sinful doctrine, and they needed to repent. As many as have not this doctrine, be faithful, he said, and hold fast till I come. And then the church of Sardis was a sleeping church. The pastor said it was a dead church. Wake up, repent, so that you will, uh, that you will be a threat to the enemy. And then tonight... We're going to talk about the church of the Philadelphia, and it's called the Faithful Church. Don't you want to be that? The Faithful Church. And so let me just give you a little bit of history. Philadelphia was located about 28 miles southeast of the city of Sardis. It was the youngest of the seven cities of these churches, being founded about 150 uh, years before Christ. Uh, and also, Philadelphia was nicknamed Philadelphias, which means the lover of the brethren. Isn't that a, what a faithful should, church should be? A lover of the brethren, that we love one another, that we're there for one another. When one falls, we pray and lift them up and encourage them. We're not there to condemn or bring down. We're there to instruct, love, reproof, yes, but we do it all in love. I can remember one time the Lord rebuked me in a dream, and it was a, a hard rebuke, but he did it in so much love, I thought it was an uplift, and it was so encouraging. So when we, we say something to somebody, let's be an encouragement. Let's be a lover of our brethren. There's a quote um, that I want to uh, read. It says, <clears throat> it was from a Bible commentary. And it says, Philadelphia sat on a high volcano platform. And the history reports that the city was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD, along with Sardis and some of the other cities that were local. Most of the others recovered rather quickly from the disaster, but the aftershocks continued in the city of Philadelphia for quite a number of years, with the results that the people had to flee the city repeatedly. So I would think that that would bring in some fears. I would think that you would have to uh, really rely upon the Lord. And it reminds of us, us. We go through troubles. We go through trials. 
We go through difficult situations in our lives, and it should be the thing that would cause us to run to God, not run away, to hold fast. And we'll be seeing more about that in a little bit. But <clears throat> let's look at the text tonight. And uh, we're going to put it on the overhead, and we're going to read. I would ask for everyone who's able to stand, to stand, and let's read this text together, and then we're going to pray. And to the angel, read it with me. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth." Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you have a purpose for each one that's in this room tonight. Father, that it's no accident, Father, for those that have come tonight. Father, that you are our Lord. You are our God. So we're just asking tonight, Lord, bless you bless your word anoint your servant father let me speak the words that you've placed within my heart and do it as unto you father for your name to be glorified we thank you father that the enemy is bound he has no place in this service and no place in our lives and we just give you the praise for who you are we want to serve you diligently lord in the name of your son yeshua hamashiach jesus our messiah amen you may be seated <clears throat> Revelation 3 7. We're going to go over these verses again individually, quickly. And, um, and so Revelation 3 7 says, Him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, what he opens, no man can shut, and what he shuts, no man can open. Okay, when I was studying that, there's only one other place throughout all the scriptures that I found the words holy and true together right there. Only one other place. And that was in uh, Matthew 6, 8, I mean 6, 10. But I'm going to read, uh, not Matthew, Revelation 6, 10. But I want to start with Revelation 6, 9. It says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? It almost seems like a time of judgment, because they were crying out, You're holy, you're true. When are you going to revenge the blood, what, what they've done to us? When are you going to bring revenge upon the earth? So it could be, when I, when I looked at all these verses, seven verses, seems like it's a time that God was going to pour out his judgment. Because it talks about how uh, there's going to be an open door and how he's going to keep us in a time of great of, uh, tribulation and uh, how he's going to make us a pillar in the sky. So to me, it looks like a, a part of it could be a time of judgment. It also, that same scripture um, comes from the reference of the key of David. It comes from Isaiah 22, 20 to 23. So I'd like to read that. 
It says, and it came to pass in that day that I will call my servant al which means God will establish, and the, he, who was the son of Ki, um, Kilkiah. It says, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Jacob. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, which thinks, what I, seems like to me is government. He will lay them upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. So this is talking about the servant of the Lord, but it's also talking a prophecy about Jesus when he's coming. He, he has the, uh, the key uh, of David upon him. He has the government that rests upon his shoulder. We see that in Isaiah 9, 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen? God has got a work to do in the church, and there's going to be judgment. We know there's going to be judgment, but uh, God's in control of that, and we are, like Pastor Roy says, we are to continue to fight. We don't just lay down and say, oh, all bad times are coming. We're continue to stand up, be strong in the Lord, and fight. Fight the enemy. There is, um, we're going to go to Revelation 3, 8, number 2, the second church, the second scripture. It says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. And has kept my word and has not denied my name. That word strength is also uh, dunamis, which means power. You have a little power. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot of power to do God's will. Maybe they were worn out. Maybe they went through so many trials that their strength seemed to be lessened. But even with a little strength, you still have the power of the Lord to do what he's calling us as a church and as an individual to do. We still have that power, right? Is the power of the Holy Spirit in us? Is he in us? Then we have power. Uh, I might be worn out because I've been doing a lot for Lyndall, but I still have God's power in me. That's what keeps us going. No matter what we're going through, we have power. That word keep and has kept my word. I love that. He says, he has, you have kept my word uh, and has not denied my name. We need to keep God's word. That word kept actually <clears throat> means to watch, to guard properly by keeping the eye upon. What are we keeping the eye upon? We're keeping the eye upon God's word. We're keeping his word and we're not denying his name. If I forget God's word and I leave it alone and I forget about it, I might be tempted to deny the Lord's name. So it's very powerful, very important for each one of us as a believer to spend some time, to spend time in God's word, to make time for God's word. Galatians 4, 3 says, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. So that open door, I believe also may be, um, we got to remember that Philadelphia was located in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and uh, it was on a road called the Imperial Road, and it was a uh, it was a, a trade route with lots of traffic and lots of people traveling, and um, so I believe that it was also an open door of ministry so that they could share the word of the Lord. You know, that's what we're called to as a church. Not just uh, here at the church, but everywhere we go. That as God opens doors, as he gives us a green light, as the Holy Spirit moves upon us and leads us to witness to somebody that we're there. I'm asking for boldness. I'm asking for boldness in my own life. Because sometimes you don't want to be rejected, so you just keep your mouth shut. But I'm asking for boldness for me. I'm asking for boldness for you. That God will do his work 
within us. Uh, Revelations 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and they are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. The synagogue of Satan. Um, it says, according to this letter, that the Philippi Philippian, the Philippians believers were suffering persecution uh, by the hands of the local Jews. And so uh, the, the, uh, the revelation calls them the synagogue of Satan. But, you know, also in Matthew 17, it talks about beware of false prophets, those that come to you as wolves in sheep clothings. Uh, God is calling us to beware. He's also calling us to have discernment in this hour, not to uh, if, if they say Christ is over here or Christ is over there, don't believe them. We know when Christ appears where he's going to come from. So um, the scripture says worship, the word worship. Make them to come and worship. Would not, it would not be the, Philippian, the Philippians believers, Philadelphia church believers, that would uh, have them worship. But it, Daniel 2.46 says this, Then the king of Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, and he worshipped David, Daniel. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. So God is working in our lives, and so I believe there's an open door upon the church. I believe God is going to be manifested greatly. It's going to cause the world, it's going to cause others to come to us and worship the God that we serve, to come and to uh, see something different in lives than what they're seeing in the world. Amen? It reminds me of, um, it reminds me of the times in our lives when it's very difficult, and yet we keep serving the Lord. And we see God manifest himself in the situation. We see that situation turned around, and we see it being a witness for God. In our lives, we want to be able to glorify God in everything that we do. We're going to look at um, Revelations 3.10. It says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, endurance, and perseverance, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. When I looked up that word patience and endurance and perseverance, we see it over and over and over and over in the scriptures. Uh, Matthew 10, says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. We shall endure. Luke 21, 17 through 19 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Then Luke 21, 28, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your hand, heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You know, uh, the pastor talked about the, the ten virgins and how five of them were ready and five of them were not prepared. They didn't have their oil. So when God opens a door and knocks on the door, we want to be a prepared people for him. Amen? We want to be able to have our light shining. We want to have the Holy Spirit in our lives. We want to be seeking after him, not having to go after it, but that it remains within us. So this is where the, where the Lord kept telling the church, repent. Because it's so easy for us to fall away from what we know to do that is right. Amen? It's so easy to fall away from doing what we know to do is right. Because we're human. But God loves us and God forgives us and God's drawn us unto himself. He loves us. He wants his will to be done in our lives. Number five, Revelations 3.11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. 
Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That's something that we are declared to do. Hold fast that what we have. Hold it fast. So that I don't want no one to take my crown, do you? We're going to have crowns for everything that we do, and we get to lay that crown at the feet of Jesus because he is worthy of everything. And I don't want no one to take my crown because I want to be able to lay that crown at the feet of Jesus. Job 27, 6 says, My righteousness, which is the righteousness of Christ in us, our righteousness, he says, I hold fast. I will not let it go. Can we say that? I hold fast. His righteousness in me, and I will not let it go. Proverbs 4.13, take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she, wisdom, is thy life. Take a hold of God's instructions, what he's instructing us as a church, what he's instructing us in this word. Take a hold of it. Don't let it go, for it's our life. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Prove all things, have discernment, judge it. Hold fast that which is good. Let go of that which is bad, hold on to that which is good. And then Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. You know what Paul said? He said, press towards that mark of that high calling. Forget those things that be behind us. Put your hands to the plow and go forward. That's what he's calling us to do as, as a church. He wants us to live our lives holy and perfectly unto him because he's a perfect God. We can't do it in ourselves, but we can do it through his strength. And then Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. We started it off with faith. We're going to end it with our faith. It's faith that helps us uh, defeat the enemy. Faith comes by hearing the word of the Lord. So uh, we are to uh, hold fast that which we have. You know the word the Lord spoke to me. We hear so many times the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. He said it at the very end of uh, the book of Revelation. Behold, I come quickly. We hear it all the time. And... Uh, it wasn't too many years ago I heard the Lord audibly, and this is what he said. The blessed hope is coming to an end. What is the blessed hope? The return of the Lord. The blessed hope is coming to an end. He's coming, church. He's coming soon. We need to be ready, keep our light, our light upon us, and keep strong in him. Then number six, Revelations 3.12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Amen. Awesome. This is future. This is going to happen to us. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. Did you know that we are overcomers in Christ? That he overcame, and because of him overcoming, we are automatically, we are overcomers in him. It's what he did. He, he fought the enemy. He overcame. It says, God promises that he will not just honor overcomers by erecting a pillar in their name in heaven, as was the custom in Philadelphia, but he will make them pillars in the spiritual temple of God, the new Jerusalem. So even as we're sitting here today and uh, there be pillars around the church and some elders are called pillars and, you know, but in the heavenly, in the heavens, when we get there, we're going to be called pillars of the kingdom of the heavens. Awesome. That word overcome actually means to subdue, conquer, overcome, prevail, get the victory. We are overcomers. And I just want to go back again through the six, seven churches, through the six churches, starting with Ephesus, and just read that part of every church, what the Lord says about overcomers. Because we are an overcomer. We can claim all of these 
churches, what the Lord is saying to them, we can claim that for us as an overcomer. It says, as an overcomer, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, <clears throat> which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In the paradise of God. To eat of the tree of life. That's what we get to do. To Smyrna, he writes, and to the church of Revive. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by hurt of the second death. There's going to be a second death. There's going to be uh, everlasting fire. It's called the second death. We will not be partakers of that because we are overcomers. Amen? Pergamos. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in that stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saith he that receiveth it. And Pastor talked about that. I would just encourage every one of us to go back over those, uh, those messages that the pastor preached on this. I did that this week. I went back over them. They're powerful messages. Then in Tyatira, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Can you imagine that we're going to be rulers with the Lord? That at what, however we are doing what we're doing now, we're being, we're being uh, uh, it's being recorded. And according to our, our life and according to how God works in us, he's going to put us in places we're going to rule, we're going to reign with him in the heavenlies on this earth and do the works of the Lord. Can you imagine subduing nations? I'm ready. I'm excited about it. And I will give him the morning star. Then he says, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in right raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then we've read this before, but Philadelphia, and again to us, the church at Revive. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, I will write upon him my new name. We are overcomers, each and every one of us. We need to confess that. I am an overcomer through Jesus Christ. I'm empowered by his power. I am liberated from the works of the enemy. I am free through the son of Jesus. I am free. Jesus was an overcomer. John 16, says this. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. 1 John 2, 14, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Doesn't it feel good when you overcome the wicked one? Doesn't it feel good when you overcome a trial or a temptation? It's powerful stuff. God's word is powerful. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. We need to confess that. Say that with me. I am born of God. I overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even my faith. It's our faith that gives us the victory that overcomes the world. The faith that the Lord has given us. And then Revelations 3.13. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That word hear, in the Greek, it means to understand. You know, Greeks are known to be thinkers, so they understand. In the Hebrew, it means shema, and it means to hear, but it means to obey, and it's uh it's, uh, you know, Israel is very, is their, um, their language is known as a language of action. And so um, to hear something is to hear it, understand it, obey it. That's what God is calling us to do. He's calling us as a people to know him, to walk in him. We all know the word. 
we've all, most of us have been grown up with the word, so we know what the word is, but we can't just know it. We've got to act upon it. We've got to ask the Lord to help us if we're struggling in a certain area. Say, Lord, help me through this thing. He says, ask and you shall receive. If you have a difficulty in every, any situation, I don't care if it's small or if it's big, God says, ask. And he's, help, he's there to help us. He's there to support us. He is not here to condemn us. He is not here to beat us up. He's here to support us and to love us and to help us to be overcomers. And we need to confess out of our mouth every day, I am overcomer. I overcome by my faith. Amen? We are strong. We are strong in the Lord. Then... Um, <clears throat> There's, there's one other thing I want to do before we close in a couple of things. God commendeth the seven churches. And I just want to go over this again. And I, again, I encourage you to go over these scriptures, seeing what God is saying, uh, what he chastised the church for what they were doing wrong and how he told them to repent. And then how he said to them uh, that they overcame and the blessing that was for them by being overcomers. So in the correction that he said, he said to Ephesus, know, your, know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how that canst not bear them which are evil, but thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and they are not, and I have found them liars, and has borne and has patience and my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. He commended the seven churches for these things. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know thy works, this is Pergamus, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Tyatira, I know thy works and the charity and thy service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Sardis. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And Philadelphia, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. If we're the church, if we're the last church, if we're the last people here, that before the coming of the Lord, if we're that church, then I'm asking God to do a great work amongst us here at Revive. When he opens a door of utterance that we'll be able to speak what he's calling us to speak. When he, when he shuts a door, if he shuts a door, you know, no man can open it. Uh, it reminds me of the ark uh, when, when God shut the door and when judgment came, no man could open that door. Even Noah himself could not open that door. But God, when he shuts a door, it cannot be opened. When he opens a door, it cannot be shut. So there's um, the church ha needs to have the ears to hear. And let me read these last few scriptures. It says in Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what he's calling us as a church that we are a holy church, that we are without spot, that we are without a blemish. And that's what he's coming back for. He's, the church in Acts 16.5, it says the churches was established through faith. In 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. No confusion, but peace. He doesn't want us to be confused. He wants us to have his peace in our lives. Uh, in the Israel, they call it shalom, and shalom means everything. It means peace, well-being, health, prosperity. He wants us to have his shalom in our lives, his peace. If everything falls out from under us, he wants us to be able to have his peace. That's what my prayer is. That's my prayer for myself, for my household, my children, my grandchildren. That's my prayer for you, that you will experience God's peace. No matter what the devil throws at us, that we will experience God's peace. Then 1 Corinthians, um, 2 Corinthians 8, 1, the grace of God was bestowed upon the churches. We are the church, and his grace is being bestowed upon us. He gives us grace 
to be able to handle any situation. He says he wouldn't put upon us anything that we'll not be able to endure or to handle. And then 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience, for your faith, for your persecutions, in all of your persecutions, in all of your tribulations that you endure. So God is calling us. He wants us to have the patience. He wants us to hold fast that which we have, to do the things he's called us as a church and individual to do. So I want us to stand. I want us to be committed and, and submit ourselves totally unto the Lord this, this evening. And we know God. We know that God's got good things. We know when the pastor preaches, Valerie teaches, and others that speak from this pulpit, that God's got good things in store for this church. If he's got good things in store for this church, and you're part of this church, he's got good things in store for you, more than what we can imagine with our own minds. And I can, I'm an imaginer. I'm a visionary. And it's more than what we can imagine, what God wants to do.